Hey, Josh. That started, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. People, this is coconuts. You used to call it cops. Disambiguation. Anyway, so uh, yes, complex networks, uh, and it will be a little bit of a. Okay, so I'll sort of I'll talk about it. I'm just going to show you a disaster. So I'm, I haven't been able to commute for a couple of years now. So that's what I see. Yep, down we go. <laughs> anyway, and I get up and I ask the most. What's the most important question when you heard it when you have a bike crash? Hey. Is the bike okay? Is the bike okay? <laughs> yeah. So I have video of me saying that because the biological unit is irrelevant. <laughs> No, but it could be damaged. It could be damaged. It could be damaged. Anyway, this is coming back in the night, and I knew this was going to be icy. This is irrelevant, obviously, to the whole course. And I think this is going to be fine, but no, I, no, I know it's bad. I know it's bad. So you see, I'm going very slowly. Yeah, it is, but it's not the studded one. See, look at that. And then, oh, anyway, so. Anyway, it's good to get bruises and not uh, break your leg, so. Anyway, so I ordered some studded tires, and uh, they're good. The, his the history of my bike commuting in the winter is I bought a bike a day out, two days after I came to the US in 1994, and uh, that bike survived for about 20 years because the, um, you know, Boston and New York City, and then here it got killed, though, eventually by the salt, because this, Romanos are just salt things. They're just, it's just an unbelievable amount of salt. Anyway, you've got Do Not Resuscitate from um, Ski Rack, which is, you know, probably debatable, but um, they basically were like, we're not going to be involved with this. Do what you will. Um, anyway, so now I can commute again. But studs, yeah. Okay, so uh, I've been trying to uh, get all of this going again, this machine. It took, I, I sort of things out last night and compiled it, and it took about five and a half hours. So. It's a very silly amount of LaTeX and uh, <coughs> very, very silly. Okay, so a few slides are up. What I've done is, uh, right, we're going to quickly go through this little bit of introduction today and then get to branching networks. So this is going to be you know, real branching networks and this will move into the two um, morphological ones and then uh, biological ones. And then we'll connect back to the material that we talked about in Pox, which was the, um, right, the, uh, how you distribute sources and sinks, right? So that it will get, we'll come back to that point, and of course we won't go through that again. But uh, that's that's a sort of set of optimal network structures. Uh, yeah, and there are a lot of other possibilities in here, but I do want to move a little bit into text um, and stories and uh, language. There'll just be some sort of new material, which will take me a crazy amount of time to um, create. All right, so. In terms of episodes, this is actually just from like last time around, which was two years ago. Um, so that's a full set. These were actually, I think, from my you know ridiculous point of view, they were actually um, well made, and, and um, so I'm happy with that. So they're kind of in a box. I guess I will record this, but in a minimal kind of way. So we'll see. <laughs> I wanted to save myself a little bit of time to develop new things. Anyway, I am crazy. Okay, okay. So uh, yeah. Right, so storyology is a course I'm going to create um, slowly, but uh, that's where we are. Huh, what else can I show you? Right. All right. I think that's pretty good. Yeah, so the, uh, the tweets are here. It actually does have its own Twitter feed. Um, so it's Networks Fox, right? And you know you don't have to be on Twitter or anything. You can just come to the website, and those tweets will be housed here, right? So I know some people get um, worried about that. <laughs> you do not have to set up your Twitter, as people say. Uh, okay, so there's just some random things here, but there's also Pox, um, Pox Vox, and there's also Storyology Vox. So there's some madness, and maybe I'll sort of put, I should put them all together. Uh, over the years, Danforth and I have kind of basically created, uh, we probably have about 15 accounts together. So we, we have a tweet cannon, which isn't a great idea, which where we you know, retweet each, everyone gets retweeted at the same time. So we're trying to 
control ourselves a little bit. <laughs> um, okay. All right, so this is a bit of an overview. Let's do that. Hmm. What else can I tell you? 8.30 a.m., well done. Everyone is super pumped to start the <laughs> semester. Everyone's awake. Nothing goes wrong as the semester goes along. In fact, get more energy. All right, All right well, let's try to do that. Uh, my children are you know, old enough now that we can sort of manage the, the morning. So, yes. Okay. Um, all right. Pratchett is still involved. He's still. <laughs> if you're Instagram fans, you should you should follow Pratchett. I recommend it. Um, of course, it's our cat. But anyway, all right. Okay. Complex networks. Um, well, this is just to say again that, that I work with Danforth in the Story Lab. Some of you have joined that, um, and, and we're always happy to involve more people. Um, these are some of the, well, I guess it's sort of a summary of my work over the years, and I'm going to be talking a little bit at this first part to start with branching networks, uh, but of course I'll talk about other people's work, it's not just my stuff. Um, but we need to add more little figures down here. So an objective of this course, we had projects in parks. This course we're going to really try to make papers. Right? You kind of had a go at that. You know, the template was there. You don't have to do this. Uh, but the template was there to sort of create an archive, like a nice archives looking paper that we would submit to a journal in principle. Um, certainly, at least 40 of these papers have come out of these courses in some ways. Right? I've been involved or touched by these courses. So it takes a long time, sometimes. But I, I kind of want to go a little more directly at it this time. Let's see if these are lies. Um, OK. I mean, there are strange things that I have in here. Let me show you this. So for example, this is, um, I know, I know, you've probably seen this. But here's the course settings, right? So including things like acronyms. Anyway, so I have to fix those things up. I think it's good. All right, so uh, you know what we're doing. We'll probably have office hours after lecture, maybe, and back over at Farrell. Um, for some reason, last time I remember this, that the, this this room was just empty after my lecture, so we just had office hours. It was great. Um, <clears throat> it's just a festival of talking. Okay, there are things. I guess I should fix those. This is basically a crazy engine. Okay, good. Office hours will. That's a suggestion, but we'll, we'll work on that. Um, this is interesting, right? So. Uh, so if you're registering um, complex systems, if you're not in the master's program, um, you might want to get this. And so there are five courses in that. We are going to move this to be complex systems and data science, and we have this scaffolded set of, who knows, scaffolded set of um, uh, kind of academic offerings. And it starts with data science now as, as an undergraduate degree. Uh, statistics people still don't like it, they're still having trouble with it, it still hurts them. They make jokes about it, they think science, uh, having to say science in, a, in the name of a science means it's not a science. But um, if you actually, if you look back uh, in time, and this is pretty easy to find, I think even in the 80s and 90s, you have people within the statistics community saying, we should call this data science, that would be a better brain. And everyone's saying, no. Uh, anyway, it's, it's a branding that has um, captured a lot of people's attention. and. and for good reason, because those words are pretty plain. Data isn't going away, much like the words complex and systems are good words. Right? You've got things like cybernetics and other kind of crazy terms, um, which were just didn't feel right. Anyway, so these are good words, and uh, data science is a good word. So anyway, so we've, uh, we've always been great, so we kind of walk out of it. Um, so that will be complex systems, data science. Then, of course, we have the masters in complex systems, data science, and our PhD. Uh, is all, but um, there's a lot, the board, board of Trustees has to put a stamp on it. But the hard part where you have to get the other faculty to agree, um, it's really an incredible process because it starts with an individual or a small group that goes through the departments and then a college and then it's at a sort of university scale and the progress sees it several times. It's a hilarious um, map of, of nightmare bureaucratic. Anyway. Uh, of course, universities somehow only produce the, the best things. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, craziness. Um, anyway, so we'll have that. Very excited about that. We've got a lot of um, uh, excitement from outside as well. You know, students and also 
And this is an odd transition for our corporations now, right? So, and I don't mean evil corporations, but um, ones that we've been interacting with who seem to be uh, good and you know overflowing with data and, and want, to, um, you know, want to help people, want to be around. Right? They're not like Facebook where they can do whatever they want to you and um, no one, no one can stop them, right? So these are these are places that the customer really matters. So Mass Mutual is one of them. Computer Associates is now probably going to give us um, a couple of um, PhD lines for, for maybe three years, which is great. Uh, we already have some of that from Mass Mutual. Uh, but I, let me just say that things have changed a lot. So five years ago, I don't think these kinds of they wouldn't have been interested in PhD students, right? And it's always been a bit of a issue, getting a PhD is great, right? You're very smart and you're learning lots of things, it's a great time in life, you should do it if you can, but you can become a little too well-trained and not particularly useful for some, for, for many kinds of places. That's sort of a little bit of a joke, but, um, but that's not really true anymore. I mean, you need a lot of sophisticated thinking to be able to solve some of the problems that are out there. And this is not just, you know, corporations, but government. You know, journalism now needs like big time data scientists to, to really get through things, uh, right? Because they just, you know, the Panama Papers get released and, and that's turned into just a, a big collection of people working on that. You know, they have to build websites to show things, all this sort of stuff. It's, it's, so it's all, it's all, uh, it's very unifying. And I guess I've said this a lot, but, you know, there are unifying, um, and that's what we talked a lot about in Pucks, there are, there are elements that are unifying across these disciplines. A lot of things have algorithms and code involved in them in some way. You know, genetics has, you know, there's biology, but you get down to yeah, you get down to being code, of course, language, all these things. But also the tools we use, right? So there's been a sort of a unification of the tools we use. So a lot of people, people Python is being used in a ridiculous number of disciplines, very different ones, right? from the humanities to ecology to physics. So that's very helpful, actually, because it gives you a uh, lingua franca. Um, but it is both about the patterns you see and, and the tools you use. So this has been a, a great change, a uh, wonderful change. So I think it's a renaissance time in science. All right, so there, there are these things. And as I said, the PhD will um, come online soon. All right, so you've seen these things. These are how to get around these notes if you use them. I mean, you know, people just scroll through them or whatever. We'll never look at them again, but these are, there are little navigation things. things. And of course, there are uh, references. This is a a thing that I offer, right? So here's a reference, and if you click on the PDF, you should get it. These are all just housed at UVM. This is naughty of me. People complain sometimes because they, spell, you know, uh, pu uh, academic publishing is ridiculous and it's owned by other people. Right. Okay, there's some madness that I use down here. You don't, you may want to do some of that, but I don't know. Okay, font. All right, and I'm gonna. I'm, I really am trying to get a book done, but that is not easy. Okay, season eight. Yes. All right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so, as I said, there's a full complement of episodes from last time, so I may have to end up pointing to those. Uh, it's just some original stuff for, for where this um, support came from. Uh, we'll still have Slack. It's not a place that I'm necessarily gonna be in, but uh, that's for you guys to talk about. It's a good place to talk about. To set up a discussion group for assignments um, and for, of course, projects. All right, so it's there. So if you're not in that, please let me know. I uh, will use the same one as Pox, right? We're not going to add a new one. And people behave well. This is, yeah, this is where I have it now for, right, for grading projects, talks. They're a big deal. I've got them at 36% in assignments, but we'll see how many we, we end up with. 10 is a lot, isn't it? All right, because I may change the end of this thing, we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Grading always works like this, three if it's correct, two if it's not bad, one if it needs a lot of work, and zero if it's way off, so that's usually, doesn't matter how long the question is. I mean, it's broken down reasonably. All these things, you know about these things, access, if you need, please write to me. Yep, yep. Okay, and we're gonna go into May. All right. Okay, so let's see how this, uh, this works. So um, you have a lot of stuff about branching networks and optimal supply networks to start with. There's a whole lot of stuff on generating functions which I know will be very appetizing for some of you. Right. But, uh, and it is beautiful, so we'll get into a little bit of that. We'll have to do some of that. Uh, 
But I'll, I'll, these, are, these are sort of special topics a little bit towards the end. I want to change those things around. Uh, a big piece that I want to bring in is uh, I'm going to really show the happiness work properly that we've done with the fund balance work here, how to really analyze text in a, in a good way. We'll look at things like Google Books, um, some nice stuff about Zip's Law, and again, these are from students who've been in these classes. Um, but of course, that'll be mixed in with, with the work of many other people. So I think that's going to be, because I do think stories is a huge, huge piece of where everyone should be going. All right. OK, so teams for the semester-long projects is great. You don't have to, but it really is good. Um, I don't know, this is probably too strong, but ideally, in some ways, everyone has their own project, and you're part of teams around each project. And this is how we like to do our research, right? so that you have someone who's leading a a project, and then they may be two, it could be, you know, all of us could be involved, really, some of the bigger pieces. But you have someone else in charge of that, but then they're also part of other projects, right? So sometimes in research groups you end up with people being siloed, and you know, there's sort of one working on each special thing, but we want to have this overlap. And actually the work, uh, some work by Jim Bagro here uh, in Complex Systems has suggested that this is when from GitHub, right? So he's analyzed teams on GitHub, which is a huge repository. Um, I mean, it's the world's biggest repository for code and incredible place to study. Uh, you know, and obviously, you can't interview everyone and do all those sorts of things, but from a sort of a distant point of view, study uh, teams. And that seems to be an aspect, right? So you have someone who's leading a group, and then they're on a bunch of other projects, and they're not in charge of those, but they're contributing uh, peripherally. And it's just a healthy thing. Anyway. I'm not sure if we can do that in a class, but that's an idea. But I think you should feel free to contribute and help each other. See, we're trying to do a different thing in academia. Be nice, be good people. Um, so stories, narratives, language, they're pieces that I really want to move to. And as I said, I'm trying to create a new course. It will be incredible to submit to uh, the archive by the end of the semester. So that will be, that's an aim. It doesn't have to happen. As I said, some of these things take years. Um, if you had a project in Pops, you may want to keep building that one up. Yes, right. And and I know, you know, and I know there are definitely some many many projects that that um, I don't know. We just I I need to figure out how to help you guys get them done. Okay, help me help. Okay. So uh, as we've talked about, it can be novel stuff. It could be something that's well established. We can talk about that. Uh, we have the two talks. I guess we'll still do this. Yep. Yep. Talks are good, right? Um, okay, and the written piece, of course, is going to be a paper. So, uh, the fact, all you have to do is ask me, right? We can get all, hopefully, your professor, if you work with someone, you can get involved in that. Oh, that's not hard. Uh, it's a massive Linux system, and we have, for example, we have some pretty big data sets on that. We have 10% uh, of all tweets, for example, going back to 2008. So, that is a lot of data. Uh, but other things like yeah, just all, all sorts of things. A lot of uh, climate data there as well. Um, so that's fun. All right, academic output, yes. Okay. It's my little thing about narrative hierarchy, right? So if you've, done, if you, if you've, done, if you've found something you think is gonna be, you know, you're excited about some research, then you, you know, eventually you need to be able to produce it all this scale. And, um, you know, I talked a lot about spreading and contagion in Pox, and I, I, I think in the right way, right, that's how you should think about your work. Is this something that people will really use and want to show each other? Uh, you know, is it, does, it, does it matter, right? And one way of looking at whether it matters is does it spread? Bad things spread too, but yeah. All right. So that's just a little bit of warming back up to where we are. I have to understand how this works. Okay, good. It's a different time slot. Okay, 8.30. Okay, good. All right. Anyway, this is a great group. I'm very excited to see all you guys back. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been a fun semester. So it should be a little bit more of a, well, no, I, I mean, I really have a full course here, but I'm, it's going to get maybe a little more um, open towards the end. A little more fun. Always fun. All right. So let's just repeat this. Uh, what I'm going to do is, take all the complex network stuff that was in Pox and just sort of house it in this course as well, right? It's just going to sit there as, as stuff you can look back on if you need to. 
but we're going to move on to, to different aspects. Um, and I'll just repeat, just touch on a few of the pieces that we really focused on. So a lot of complex systems are really complex networks. Right? And, and in some ways, so this is about 20 years now uh, that, that this area, I mean, it's unbelievable, a fifth of a century has been um, developing. Uh, and as you may recall, small world networks and scale free networks were the sort of first big uh, pieces that got everyone excited. You know, they were published in Nature and Science. I'll mention them again. Um, there was very much a physicist kind of thing to start with. Um, right, StatMech was the big deal. Computer scientists have come along and added a lot more, uh, I don't know, just optimization, making things do things. You know, uh, now we've got the deep learning. Now we're in deep learning time. It's like, you know, how can I, how can I replace your your work with deep learning? Um, so, so we're kind of battling through that, which of course has given us this world where we don't understand things. We make algorithms that wait, that are um, yeah, black boxes. Okay, so there's that. Um, but in some ways, that's sort of been burning through. Uh, I think we're still in the we're still really in the the data is getting better stage, right? There's still more data coming in from different places. It's getting refined. We're understanding things better. Uh, for example, a very long time, for a very long time, we just sort of looked at networks as these static things because that was you know, that was enough, right? And, and we just the links were just sort of a unit weight, and that was interesting over time that's sort of given way to thinking about networks that evolve in time, hard. So unbelievable amount of work's been published. Um, and I know I've used this joke before, but basically uh, these characters have been out of control. Anyway, They're still hungry, they're still eating away at the field, but um, they need something else probably pretty soon. The problem for physicists is that uh, a lot of the really interesting stuff as you get out of physics is because of algorithms, right? Life is full of algorithms. Social phenomena is full of algorithms, economics. So that's not really a, in the tool set. OK, so this is how you know your papers. Well, this is one way to look at success, of course, we've talked about that. But there's a lot of citations from me, right? So on Google Scholars, from Google Scholar, uh, which it's a bit more than say web of science and, and some of the other ways of counting because, and I think they do the right thing. They count. Um, I think in Google Scholar they count uh, computer science uh, proceedings, which I don't know. Which is you know that's that's a big deal for computer science. They publish in, they go to conferences and publish in proceedings, and they have to they have deadlines. So you get all these papers that are exactly eight pages long, and it looks like they were finished on a deadline. Right? So that's okay. But it's a field where that's acceptable. Like you don't really do that in physics. That's not good. Anyway, uh, so they counted. So the numbers are uh, higher, but they correlate very strongly. Anyway, these are really huge numbers. So Google Scholar will give you a little kind of badge if you get a ten. <laughs> if you have a paper that gets to ten, that counts. But there's a little thing that says so. There's the H index, which is how many papers you have that have been cited. If it's H, H is the number of papers you have that have been cited at least H times, right? So getting to a hundred for that is sort of insane. That means you have a hundred papers that have been cited a hundred times, at least a hundred times each. Uh, that's pretty unlikely. But then they also have this little ten count, which is how many papers you have that have been cited ten times. Being cited once is a stat, right? Because zero is the is the mode number of um, mode number of citations for papers, or one, zero or one. It's not, you know, it's a skewed distribution and it doesn't have a little hump at the front. It is pretty brutal. So, um, yeah, so exactly. So you have to, yeah. And there are some things, I think on Web of Science, you can click a button that says take away self citation. Which for some people matters. I think the worst one I've ever seen was, um, was a, Contagion epidemiology paper. Castillo Chavez, this guy, who was at Los Alamos, and I think two thirds, Duncan Watson, I have a lot of this, two thirds of the citations, there were about 40, were, were his paper. He's playing the game, you know? I mean, yeah. Uh, the bad things have happened, right? Because, you know, it used to be like, just get out of like, you just, you know, humans are terrible at 
Well, they're really good at coming up with kind of good things to measure themselves against, but then they will terribly kind of find a way to, you know, I mean, organizations have this sort of problem all the time, people cheat in sports, whatever, right? And things go wrong. Uh, then you have to add more rules to say, you know, really want, we want you to do the ethical thing. We've got these rules here to help you. It's like, no, I'm fundamentally not ethical. Um, I think it was a journal, Chaos maybe, the, the editor of that got in a lot of trouble because they'd basically just been getting every paper to cite them, right, because they were overseeing the whole thing and it turned into some sort of, anyway, self-citating, citing ridiculous thing. Um, yeah, we get wiped out, some of these papers just get wiped out. Right, it's like uh, Penn State losing all their wins or whatever. It's, uh, it happened with, uh, it was a Dutch psychology professor who, who basically lied about everything for 10 years, just made data up because he realized he could. He just could. He could just make things up. And lots of papers, they proved all sorts of interesting things about humans, all gone. And so all these people just lost papers. If you were on the paper, just go, gone. Anyway. All right. Anyway, these are huge number of citations. Uh, as I said, they're now coming up to the 20 year anniversary. Uh, and there are a few other big ones as well, but these are sort of the, the starting ones. It is hard to start a new field, but it was sitting there. And let me just say again, the big deal was people think about networks, they think about graphs, right? Oil is sort of the big person we point to for thinking about graphs in good ways. Right? Um, I'm still I don't know if you want to, yeah? Is that fair? Oil is sort of a bit of a hero in terms of graph theory, right? So to say, yeah, wrote some things down. And, you know, it was sort of the first person to really, yeah. Um, but, and then you have a lot of, a lot of work, people like uh, uh, Edish and so on, working on random networks, you know, really interesting people. Work on. But then it turns out if you look at you know, real networks, they, they are um, unusual. And uh, from a sort of a, a random selection point of view, and, but it's because they're they're wrong, right? They're made in a certain way, and, that, and this is of course the rich get rich argument, which is what uh, is behind um, the scale three networks. Uh, so it turns out, from a, from a from a sort of growth point of view, these are very common and reasonable. But from a sort of picking out of the box point of view, they're, they're but what I'm trying to say is that both of these uh, works were tied to data, right? And you think about this, the web comes into existence in 92, right, because of uh, the old CERN, right? It's like we have to share things, let's make nice, uh, nice ways to communicate with each other. The internet's been around since uh, we started the ARPANET in 1969. The law for us to put the little cute thing on top. And um, so this is only a few years later. And so things like websites, have emerged, and, and behind this one, this is Farazi, was it, is it Northeastern now, the Networks Institute, they had uh, the, the, the website for Notre Dame, which wasn't big, right? It was, it was small, you put on your computer and look at it. Uh, but it existed, and it was an interesting thing. Uh, they had C. Elegans in here, as you, your network, Power Grid was in both of them, and the Actigraph, which is pretty silly. But again, it's online, it was something we could get at, IMDB. Um, okay, so still in, I, we're very much still in the world of like measuring and growing and, and, and um, growing data sets and refining them. So we've talked about some of these things as I've just said. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll come back a little bit perhaps to random networks. I guess we will, it's pretty great. I wanna talk about those generating functions. I don't wanna destroy you with that. Um, but just to remind you about some of these things. So this was, the story, the generalized random networks, where we say we want to do redistribution, right? So we want to uh, pay friends, and we're going to wire them up randomly. This had to be done in a judicious way. Uh, and the nice thing about this was, well, they're just interesting in themselves, they have certain properties, uh, but then you can compare them to real networks. So this was a big, a big start to kind of saying, oh, you know, real networks are. Good. But this is, the degree distribution is, is sort of the, Big piece to start with when you start with networks. So. And uh, scale free networks, this is our barbarizing Albert, of course. They called it preferential attachment. There was this list of um, catchphrases, right? So rich get richer, which is one of the things that 
put uh, and then cumulative advantage was the solar price. And they're all saying that there's uh, rewards to those who are in front. Uh, there's also the Matthew effect, which we talked about, right? So from the Gospel of Matthew, which has the extra mechanism, right, that uh, goes wrong. If the, those who have nothing will be cast into, uh, into hell. So that mechanism is not part of the rich get ritual. Okay, so the poor get poorer. Uh, okay, preferential attachment. We get these uh, solar prices and these so-called scale-free networks, which is to say they have power law degree distributions. Certainly, many real networks, whether they have power law ones or not, they have um, skewed distributions, right? Very skewed distribution. Okay. Small worlds, that was this story. Again, I'm just touching on this, just to remind you. Uh, yeah, the idea here, and this was a toy model. They did look at Bill Garland, but they made a toy model. Uh, and, and this is sort of a, not exactly what they did, but this is a, uh, a, a world where everyone's connected to neighbors, uh, of course, to them, and so there's a clustering, right? So you have friends that, Friends with each other, which are little triangles. Uh, but if you're trying to send messages around, or a disease is trying to spread, or a good idea is trying to spread, it's going to take a while. And that's the observation of this that it looks social locally because of the clustering, but it happens to have this property of things being able to spread, or the people being connected, which was this, um, you know, this kind of anecdotal or folk story of social networks, uh, the six degree separation idea. Or this Milgram was the one who made this first experiment. We did our own experiment, talked about all these things. But in terms of a very simple model to start with, adding shortcuts collapse this world, you retain the socialness, right? People still have friends who are friends with each other, but this basically collapses the world. So local structure plus randomness gives you the small worldness. It turned out that this was not a navigable world, right? If you have a simple algorithm, it will not be, you were not able to find your way around this because they are indeed random shortcuts. Uh, so you actually need shortcuts of all different um, scales. Uh, that's one way to do it. The other, and then, uh, that's one part of it. And then ultimately, from a social network point of view, we understand who our friends are, right? So we, we have um, knowledge of our social networks because we know our friend is connected to these kinds of friends and so on, right? So we can, we can understand social distance. All right, just words, just sort of touching back on things. Okay, oh, okay. So this was this is what I just said basically. Right? So these are these are good things. We'll come back to my pipeline affiliation networks because they are really important things. But here's the idea that you have contacts up here. These could be workplaces, or this could be simply a course during the pursuit. Individuals here, and that makes a network. Let's fix that up. Yeah. These are surprisingly powerful uh, things, random versions of this, right? So you have some set of people, you know how many, friend, how many contexts are involved in, so you specify that. You have a set of contexts, and you know how many people are in each context. But other than that, you randomly wire it up. That actually turns out to be a pretty useful thing to work with, too. All right, but so boards and uh, directors, could be movies and actors, uh, lots of things have this structure. And then there are tripartite type ones as well. Uh, and this is the idea that we we know where they are, right? So the people are here, they have their, this uh, sort of an occupation thing, so they have ideas, they, they have their own um, occupations, and then they have a sense of where it is in some hierarchy. Uh, and then you can sort of generalize from that, right? So you can give people different things, so where they live, the jobs they have, what age, so that, that gives them reason or ways or context for them to connect with each other. Um, and those networks turn out to be searchable, fairly searchable. Um, so that, you know, that was a, a, a real problem that um, had uh, kind of mystified people for a long time. Right? It was clear that there was searchability in networks. And then we tracked this stuff going forward, which was um, efforts to harness this in good ways. So the red balloon search was one example, right, which was just sort of a game. But, um, there's definitely a finding the bad guys kind of thing. There's find, uh, finding uh, people who could help you with those certain problems. Right? So organizations are very interesting. If we spoke about organizations, I mean, we have these massive 
organizations and governments and even journalists, right? I mean, even say the New York Times doesn't, it's sort of clear at times it does not know everything that's going on within itself. It's big enough for it to be kind of surprised by some of the things we've published here. Okay. Um, you know, th those, some of these venues can be surprisingly unsearchable, even just on sort of a raw web page thing. So, interesting, right? I mean, if you're producing news, you're the guardian, you're producing just unbelievable amounts of news. How do you look after that? So, uh, this is just anecdotal, but I think that, and we had some work on the Guardian. The Guardian is interesting in that if you see a piece and you look down from it, they do a pretty good job of referencing back to previous pieces. Seems well done. You search in the New York Times, it's like they have no idea that their search engine is horrible. Um, there are a couple of textbooks around, uh, and you know, this is pretty mathematical. It's in my view, it's a super genius guy. Um, he's a physicist, he's got a physics flavor. Just want to put that there. John Feinberg got mentioned a couple of times in Pox, total superhero, so he's a MacArthur Genius Award winner. He's a computer science lovely guy. Uh, this fellow's in economics, I don't know, but they give this talk. So the piece is sort of sitting there. There hasn't been a. Uh, I don't know. We need, we need something more. Anyway, I mean, I put all my stuff online, but it's different to having a textbook, I guess. This is just to show you there are a couple more uh, review papers. Uh, you know, I feel like we need more of these. Review papers are very powerful things. There is a book coming out from Springer on Contagion. I've got a couple of chapters on it. Um, Contagion on Networks. Maybe that will do well for itself. Uh, but you know, again, these, these citation numbers are pretty absurd. That's of yesterday, as of yesterday too. All right, so. Um, complex networks, what's called complex networks, it really is called that. Um, late 1990s, it's matured for sure. It's considered to have been, become a mature field. Um, and it, it was a transition in thinking about systems, right? Because networks really exist, we really had quantification of them, uh, and, and it opened up. Uh, <laughs> well, get, you know, primarily gave us a realization that we weren't thinking about networks properly. That, that we had you know, the wrong idea about what they were, were like in the real world. So the complex networks are kind of large scale things. You know, that's, these are sort of somewhat amorphous terms, but sparse, meaning uh, you know, numbers do not have, they're not fully connected things, they're not sure of being fully connected. They're a long way away from that. Right? So they're interesting in that they, you know, nodes are limited things. You think of how many real friends you have, like really close friends. Facebook, which is our sociopathic overlord, um, has you know they've done some work there to examine some of these things. And I think out of Facebook, was people you know communicate a lot with maybe three or four people, right? You know, and that seems to be that's been sort of observed by social scientists doing interviews and so on. Yeah, you know, that's really bounded, right? That's not a million people. Um, and this is different to saying someone has what is it about a hundred million followers or something. Something ridiculous, right? So, you know, but he doesn't talk to them every day on, you know, text messaging, right? So that's a that's a that's a different kind of thing. But in terms of actual interactions, we're pretty limited. So, um, so meaningful connections that go both ways. This is just kind of sparse networks. Um, but of course, there are many real networks where that are that, that you know, Twitter matters, right? In the sense that you can tweet and get 100 million followers. You know, many of them will see it. You know, Trump tweets, and typically you get a like a hundred thousand favorites. I mean, that's an amazing number on average. We're actually trying to build a potentiometer, which will be kind of fun. Um, so we have lots of ohmmeters, right? You don't a meter and a lexical calorimeter, and lots of other things, but a potentiometer, um, which would start with Obama because he's the first um, tweeting. Um, but it'd be their the at POTUS and uh, their personal account, right? So you combine those. And when, you know, there aren't so many tweets, right, from any individual, but the responses are really rich. So that's what we're yeah, trying to build. Um, and we talked, uh, we talked about it the other day. I don't know if this put it down a little bit. Um, 
we talked about it in Pox, this thing that's emerged, because Twitter's actually made it a feature now, so you can see how many favorites there are, how many retweets. It's not encoded in the data set properly but that, that we received, but if you look online, you'll see the number of um, replies. And so this is now sort of talk. I have, actually, I think Urban Dictionary needs to catch up. We need to put it into Urban Dictionary. You get ratioed if you get more replies than these, these other pieces, right? So the thing called someone's going to get ratioed for some obnoxious comment. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting metric. So that's going to be something in the potosometer, like the <laughs> degree of being ratioed. Um, <clears throat> anyway. I know I did this in interaction where these sort of big uh, categories, the sort of physical ones, the real, they're hard to move around. Um, they can change over the sort of times. Uh, you know, blood networks are another example. Uh, also, neural networks, which are plastic sort of things. Uh, interactional ones where, you know, these, these are much more softer kinds of networks that can change easily. Even airline networks are like that, I suppose, right? You can just restructure things. Um, and then abstract ones, which are maybe connections between ideas, whatever you like. So this is sort of this hierarchy of networks that I like to talk about. Okay. But to start with, we're certainly going to talk about physical ones. As I said, it's going to be a, about river networks and blood networks. They have the same kinds of, not, not exactly, but they have similar uh, categorizations. And it looks at, we'll, what we'll get into there is a very enjoyable history of science story about um, how metabolism, so this is a big ecological, biological issue, how does metabolism scale, so energy metabolism, right? It's about resting metabolism organs. So you've got a bunch of bunnies, and you've got a donkey, and you've got a giraffe. They're using up energy, right? So they have to eat the food and so on, and run around a little bit, but they're, they're using energy. So how does that scale with size of organism? And you know, how many organisms are of a particular size? And then this all fits together in a big uh, ecological system. Is this thing functioning in some interesting way? So that's going to be, that's going to go back into the 1800s, and we'll start with um, uh, tobacco farmers trying to figure out how, to, how much food to feed their workers. It's not a good start. Okay, but it will be super fun. Um, okay, you're going to enjoy that. Okay, so uh, obviously we have bath areas we've talked about. But it's more about dynamics. Uh, it's the uh, the uh, small world one is not really a dynamical thing, but it's dynamics on you know, what's of interest there is dynamics on a set of networks. Right? It's a toy model, you can make the network with dynamics on top. Uh, scale for networks are very much dynamic in that they're being built. And then, of course, you think about processes on top. We're still working at that, right? We're still working at this kind of dual uh, aspect of networks evolving and processes. Uh, and of course, this is basically this is basic science, right? We want to describe things. We're still doing this. This will take a long time to do it really well and explain and to the degree we can, right? So ideally, this has been a big success in science in general. If we can take what's happening microscopically and get the microscopic behavior, then it's a huge success. Um, it may be that this is a level of a toy model. But it may be something like fluid dynamics, where we really have this powerful, powerful story that gives rise to think about it, how fluids move around locally, how they sort of speak to each other, whatever it is, that we, you know, how we want to characterize that. And then and we can do that with pencil and paper, and we end up with what's what's going on in these sorts of questions. Now, can we do that for social phenomena and for biology? Well, you know, we'll, we're figuring those things out. I think there's still a lot to be done, basically. Okay. All right. Here's an interesting one. So this is a temporal network thing. Get it to work. Not explode. There will, of course, be little videos here and there. But um, so this is based on a data set of. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember if it's surveys, but this is a simulation of people. This is just where they are, you know, what they're doing, right? So they're all asleep. <laughs> I 
I think that was the personal care one. It's so many are sleeping that the personal care one got um, squished. So the traveling between spaces in the middle. <laughs> yeah. I actually had that. Um, so this thing, well, you know, it's so debatable. Certainly, if you look at etymology, uh, and, and, uh, so evolution of English language, words that are categorized as leisure, that has just risen unbelievably in the last couple of years. This is work by Fletcher Hazelhurst, probably will uh, publish it soon. Um, I mean, people had a lot of spare time probably in the 1300s, right? Because they weren't. Yeah? We tend to think of everyone as working there themselves in pieces, but there's probably a lot of sitting around and making songs and playing lutes and stuff like that. You know, this is just a touch of some data. Where are we? Everyone's starting to go to sleep now. It does seem like everyone goofs off a lot. It's like, this should be just, leisure should be social media. What's that? Where's the data from? <clears throat> at this. See, it's hard to tell stories, right? Um, this is from... Sorry. It's a survey, right, so American Time Use Survey. Yeah, there you go. These are, these are hard things to do, right? You ask people after the fact, what did you do this week? Could people do it or at night? Yeah, but it's like well, at night usually, right? Like what happened? I have this uh, ridiculous thing that I do, right, where I record everything I do and have a taxonomy for my activities. I've said too much. Okay, so, um, but basically I could make this for myself. Okay. Anyway, there are... Bazillion things like this, you know, and there are just data sets sitting out there that are just interesting, waiting to be. Can I stop this? Wow, what is this thing? Stop. Okay. I don't know. Interesting. Okay, good. Good, good, good. 